Shalom. Welcome to Yahweh's assembly in Yahshua on this blessed Sabbath day. This is the day that Yahweh has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. If you all rise, we'll start with the blowing of the shofar on this blessed Sabbath day. Let's see if we can get the shofar so good today. <laughs> Let's lift our voices in praise to our Heavenly Father this day, starting with singing to you a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto Yahweh, I will sing to Him a new song. I will celebrate, sing unto Yahweh, I will sing to Him.
It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13, on one slide, all in unison. Finally, my brethren, be strong in Yahweh and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of Yah, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of Yah, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Hallelujah. I'd like to invite Elder Tom to come up and open us up with prayer, and to read the Torah reading for today, which is Leviticus chapter 18. Hallelujah. Good Sabbath to everyone. Let us pray. Abba Yahweh, Messiah Yahshua, we thank you for this Sabbath day. We thank you for this congregation where we can gather together and discuss your topics and learn from your word and from each other as the case may be. We thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you've given us today and throughout our lives. Blessings of uh, abundance in our lives and more than we deserve but you have watched over us and kept us safe and blessed us with uh, good food good relationships and so many abundant blessings the greatest of which is probably the blessing of Yahshua coming to be our savior we praise you for that Thank you, Yahshua. Uh, a simple thanks is, is not enough, but uh, it means everlasting life for those who qualify, and we are striving to obey and to show our love for you through our obedience. We ask your blessing on this service. Bless those who speak and uh, those who listen, and Help us to learn from your word uh, through these speakers and, and uh, apply, the, apply the word in our lives. We thank you for all your blessings you've given us in this great blessing of the Sabbath. Hallelujah. Okay. Leviticus 18. It is an interesting chapter. <clears throat> Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Leviticus 18, now verse 2, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh your Elohim. And that's an important statement. Look who's talking to us here. Our Elohim, our mighty being who has created all that we see and is entitled to rule over us and tell us what to do and what not to do 
not only because he's our Elohim and we owe our lives to him, but also because these are good things for us to do. Yahweh never gives us commands that are evil to do. Uh, he gives us commands that are good for us, and we praise him for that. And uh, this chapter is certainly an example of that. <clears throat> so the end of chapter 2, I am Yahweh your Elohim. Do not do as they do in the land of Mitzrim, where you dwelled, uh, and do not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, and uh, do not walk in their laws. Do my right rulings and guard my laws to walk in them. I am Yahweh your Elohim, in case you forgot it from two verses ago when he said it. And you shall guard my laws and my right rulings, which a man does and lives by them. I am Yahweh. So guard his right rulings. That gives me the image of somebody with a weapon uh, prepared to defend all that Yahweh has said and to do it with all our strength. <clears throat> Verse 8, no one is to approach anyone of his own flesh to uncover his nakedness. I am Yahweh. And we could skip the next 20 verses, but we won't. Because <laughs> that, that says most of what we have to read today. Uh, you shall not approach anyone uh, of your close relatives sexually. <clears throat> verse 6 oh that, that was verse 6 verse 7 the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you do not uncover she is your mother you do not uncover her nakedness the nakedness oh, I might mention an exception to this and, and it's an unusual exception but when a person's mother becomes old and needs uh, help with various things, it might be necessary for the son or daughter of that person to, uh, to see their nakedness. But that's a special situation. Is the, the son or daughter is helping their mother, and uh, it's not a sin. It's, it's something that's necessary, and they're doing it as a kindness to their mother. And there's no sexual uh, activity involved. Uh, okay. Verse 9. The nakedness of your sister, the daughter of your father, or the daughter of your mother, whether born at home or elsewhere, their nakedness you do not uncover. The nakedness of your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter, their nakedness you do not uncover, for theirs is your own nakedness. It's a close relationship. The nakedness of your father's wife's daughter, brought forth by your father, she is your sister. You do not uncover her nakedness. So even a half-sister is covered by this. And uncovering the nakedness is not just uh, lifting up her skirt, it's actually having, uh, it's, it's a way of referring to having intercourse with her. <clears throat> so, um, the nakedness of your father's sister you do not uncover, she, her, uh, she is your father's flesh. The nakedness of your mother's sister you do not uncover, for she is your mother's flesh. The nakedness of your father's brother you do not uncover. You do not approach his wife. She is your aunt. Uh, the nakedness of your daughter-in-law you do not uncover. She is your son's wife. You do not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your brother's wife you do not uncover. It is your brother's nakedness. It's for him to do. The nakedness of a woman and her daughter you do not uncover. 
uh, nor do you take the, her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter to uncover her nakedness. They are her relatives. It is wickedness. And do not take a woman as a rival to her sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. Um, okay. Verse 10. Do not approach a woman to uncover her nakedness in her monthly separation of uncleanness, and do not have intercourse with the wife of your neighbor to defile yourself with her, and do not give any of your offspring to pass through to Molech, and do not profane the name of your Elohim, I am Yahweh. Now they, uh, there were those who worship Molech, which was a false idol at that time, and uh, this involved sacrificing babies to Molech and burning them. Uh, and it, it's such an abomination. And Yahweh forbids it specifically here. Verse 22, and do not lie with a male as with a woman, it is an abomination. And do not have intercourse with any beast to defile yourself with it. And a woman does not stand before a beast to mate with it. It is a perversion. Do not defile yourself with all these, for by all these the nations are defiled, which I am driving out before you. Thus the land became defiled, therefore I punished it for its crookedness and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you, you shall guard my laws and my right rulings, and do not do any of these abominations, the native nor stranger who sojourns with you. So not only the, the Hebrews, the uh, children of Israel, but anyone else who was living, um, you might call it in a covenanted way with them. Uh, in their land are covered by these laws. Verse 27, because the men of the land who were before you have done all these abominations and thus the land became defiled. So let not the land vomit you out for defiling it as it vomited out the nations that were before you. For whoever does any of these abominations those beings who do them shall be cut off from among their people. And that was almost a death sentence. And you shall guard my charge so as not to do any of these abominable laws which were done before you, so as not to defile, or defile yourselves by them. I am Yahweh your Elohim. So he ends with the same statement that he began with. I am Yahweh your Elohim. And all these things deserve our attention and obedience. May Yahweh bless the reading of the Torah. Everybody else glad it's Shabbat? I'm happy. It's been a long week, and this day is definitely a blessing this week. It should be a blessing every week, and it is. Praise Yahweh. We don't have any announcements for today, uh, but we do have a message brought to us by Elder John. It's called The Distress of Stress. Uh, interesting. I think this will speak to me a lot. <laughs> I hope it does. I'd like to invite Elder John to come up. I want you to focus your attention just on that image for a moment. <clears throat> this was just a, a screenshot of a short video that we did on the subject of anxiety, and, and, on, <clears throat> and you can find it on probably YouTube. I guess it's still present there. But ultimately what happens is they are truly at each other's throat. <laughs> and that's not quite the ultimate expression of stress, but it certainly is a precursor to the ultimate. 
This is going to be a little bit different message, and it'll be uh, much shorter, I, I, I trust, than some of my usual messages because uh, I have no bookmarks in my scriptures. I may not even use this Bible today. However, the message is laced with scripture, and if you know your scripture, you'll be able to discern it as I speak it. <clears throat> the subject came to my mind because of the hollow season that we just completed. Not we, but the world, okay? We have to endure it somewhat grievously. You know, when you enter into a store or go to the bank, you know, you hear this acclamation, well, Happy New Year and Merry Christmas. Usually it's the other way around. And <clears throat> people then afterward will always ask you, Did you have a good Christmas? And my standard reply is, It was as good a day as any other. And that is, the, that is a response that few people expect to receive. But it's the one that I always give, and it usually stops most people in their tracks, and then you don't have to be too concerned about them asking you the next year, did you have a good Christmas? Because if they do, they get exactly the same response. Now, you can talk and tell them the truth about it, but most people, as we learned in the Bible study today, they're not interested in the truth because most people have been acculturated to hearing nothing but lies all their lives. So I'm going to start out by giving you some definitions of what stress is. And incidentally, if you find this worthy and if you care to, I'll, I'll be glad to share my notes with you at the end of the message. Appearing on a sign of curbside, oftentimes we read the following message. Life is 10% what happens to you and 90% of how you respond or react to what happens to you. And that is true. Life is only 10% of what happens to you. And it's 90% of how you respond or, and, and, and I say or because response and reaction are not synonymous terms. How you respond or react to what happens to you. So I thought I would start by giving you one, two, three, four, six, actually seven definitions of stress. It's a terrible waste of imagination. Stress always ends where faith begins. Now we know what the scripture says in Hebrews 11:6, that without faith it is not possible to please him. And with stress, it is impossible to please him. Just bear that in mind. With stress, it is always impossible to please him. Why do I say that? Because we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that he has called us to peace, right? And stress is the antithesis of peace. It's just exactly the opposite. It's diametrically opposed to peace. Stress is interest paid on trouble before it is due. You read that at curbside. And I got these from curbside, by the way, most of these. Stress is the dark room where faith is negated and doubts are developed. I'll say that again. That's a John Reese original. Stress is the dark room where faith is negated and doubts are developed. And as I progress through the message, I'm going to speak a little bit about that because I'll tell you, there are two attendees, brothers or sisters, to stress. One is worry, and the other is doubt. It's like a hand fitting into a glove. Stress makes small things cast big shadows. If anything can go wrong, it will. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any at all. Stress will cause you to look for the worst because it leads you down to the path to the worst, always. At the end of stress is death. Physiological death, spiritual death. You continue that along the path of stress, and I'll guarantee, because I've seen it as a nurse, it will result in death. Yes, we're going to talk about that too. 
A day of stress is more exhausting than a week of work. A day of stress is more exhausting than a week of work. Now this is another John Reese, and I, I, I don't take credit for it. It's actually, I shouldn't say John Reese original because you know, I believe this was inspired to me. Stress will distance you from Yahweh. It will deny him his supernal deliverance of you from its torment. Again, he's called us to peace. You remember reading there in the scripture in Romans chapter 2? Romans chapter 12, pardon me. Romans chapter 12. Let's just turn there for a moment. And this is an area where we experience a great deal of stress because we don't know how to handle certain people. You know, most of us in the workplace have had kind of ugly encounters with people that were extremely difficult to get along with. And we didn't know how to handle them. We thought, well, maybe avoiding them, maybe not sitting across from them or as far away as possible, you know, during the lunch hour and uh, not having any kind of camaraderie, not trying to, trying to even develop a closeness to them because, you know, they're loud or they're proud or they're well endowed or whatever. And we don't want anything, you know, you know what I'm talking about. People that you have to work with, rub shoulders with, but you're glad when the day ends because now you're going to have some peace and you're going to have some rest and you're going to have some quietness and you're going to have some assurance. Workplace is a pit for stress. Romans chapter 12, listen to what it says here. If it be possible, verse 18, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. And I will tell you, I like the way it's worded because it gives you an out in a way because there are, sometimes it's not possible to live peaceably with all men. Now that's not the end of the story because there are other, there are other instructions in the word of Yahweh. Well, if you can't live peaceably with someone, there's a reason why you can't. You just make sure that you're not the reason you know the old adage, it takes two people to tangle? Well, make sure that you're excluded from being a party to the tanglement. Scripture tells us to withdraw ourselves from every, it says, every brother that walks disorderly. But I want to tell you how much more from them that walk disorderly that are not a part of this holy fraternity. There are some people that we are charged by Scripture not to company with. Why? because they will corrupt your good manners. That's why. Hallelujah. Yes, stress, stress will distance you from Yahweh, denying him his supernal, that supernatural deliverance of you from its torment. You'll be so troubled you can't pray. I have experienced that. You're so troubled. Now, I want to tell you, that's in the scripture. Asaph himself, the chief musician in the tabernacle of David. In Psalm 77, verse 4, he said, I am so troubled I cannot speak. Have you ever had that trouble? You know what? The only antidote for that is when it's hardest to pray, pray harder. Oh, that's good advice, but who can they receive it, huh? When it's hard to pray, that's when you need to pray harder. Your spiritual life will dissipate into oblivion if you give in to stress. You'll find yourself, and, and I'm speaking by way of experience here, you know, and most of us can relate to and identify with what I'm talking about. Ever found yourself, I just can't even open up this book? You can't pray. You can't, you know, 
Seven days without prayer makes one weak. Listen, it's not just seven days. It's one day without prayer will make you weak. It's one day without reading this word. Have you ever experienced the most uncomfortable spiritual experience that you will ever have? Is that you feel dull? Not just dull of hearing, but dull of speaking. You'll be trying to have a spiritual conversation or someone will approach you and wanting some spiritual counsel and you just feel like, I'm dull, I'm, I'm not qualified, I don't know what to say, I'm so troubled myself and you're coming to me? And you try to pray and you can't frame the words and it's when at that point we need to understand and appreciate that the real Kakadesh was given for that very moment. We read about it, don't we, in Romans? Let me turn back a couple pages. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Ruach helps our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. And sometimes we don't know how to pray and we can't pray. We can't even frame the words in our minds to pray. You know, but the Spirit, the Ruach, itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I've had that experience, and you have too. And then the burden suddenly, and you know I, how Yahweh works sometimes? Let me just share something with you. I've had afflictions in my body. And you know, you live 75 years, you'll get them from time to time, right? And you will pray, and you will pray, and the assembly will pray, and you'll fast, and you'll do whatever you know to do by scripture. You'll be anointed with oil with the laying on of hands of the presbytery, trusting in that their prayer of faith together with your prayer of faith will effect the healing that you're seeking. And it doesn't come immediately. You begin to think, I wonder how it was with the master. It seemed like every time you read a, a narrative of the master and the evangelist have been touching someone that they immediately receive their healing. And you're thinking, how come this power is not so innate and inherent within us today? Well, I want to tell you something. There's two ways by which we inherit the promises. Actually, it's a conjunctive. Faith and patience. Sometimes there has to be a work within us within our hearts before a work can be completed without us. I'm talking about on the outside. You know what I'm talking about? One thing I know is about the Yeshua, and I'm, I'm confident of this. When he says your faith has made you whole, you know, he's holistic. I mean, a person can, you know, back in the day, when you read, you know, what would you that I do for you? Oh, master, that I might see. That I might, you know, they wouldn't say that I might speak because they couldn't speak. They were dumb. They wouldn't say that I could hear, but that I might see. Or that I might be cleansed of this skin integumentary anomaly. Leprosy. Or whatever it happened to be. And he would release them. He says, your faith hath made you whole. Whole! Not just the request that they made of him, but every wit whole, every anomaly, every physiological problem that they were experiencing in their body that they were not even aware of. You know what I'm talking about? He's come to make a person whole, to restore them. Not to just put a band-aid on your situation, but to make you a complete New person, if I may say so. Yes, these past six weeks since Black Friday, Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday, been, a, been very stressful for many hollow days, spelled H-O-L-L-O-Y-D-A-Y, hollow day, as they navigated through crowds of like-minded consumers in brick and mortar outlets made credit card debit purchases online only to face supply chain shortages of the goods they ordered, dealt with rigid return policies of incorrect orders and rude customer service representatives because they were under stress too, were embarrassed by notices of invalid credit debit cards, and now 
in January, the first month of the Gregorian calendar, the additional stress of having to pay for all these things they purchased for others who didn't show gratitude for the gift they received with money they never had and still don't. Yeah, many have resolved next time when the season without reason, that's what I call it, the season without reason rolls around just like it does cyclically every year. They're not going to stress out. But then, like most New Year's resolutions, they're not going to stress out evaporates before the New Year even begins. You know what I'm talking about? New Year's resolutions? It goes out one year and comes in the next. Many experience stress when the money ends before the month begins or before the month does. I mean, it's, and this is not just a one time a year. It's because people, they, they need to take what we gave here about three or four years ago, you know, scriptural foundations of financial integrity and security. Do you remember that message? But they don't want to follow these prescriptions. It's just too costly. When they fuel, fuel their car, they've got to buy snacks at the convenience store. You know? You know what I'm saying? When they leave, and they can't understand. You know, I want to tell you one of the things that are, are, is, is disturbing to me, I guess, because of my avocation as a senior companion. I have clients my age and older that have financial woes, and they confide in me. They don't know what to do because the medical bills are so extravagant and, but you know what? And they've got a car that they, yeah, they've got an automobile that they can't drive, but they can't understand that if they would liquidate that automobile, you understand what I'm saying? They go out to eat every day. And I'm thinking to myself, when you get to be my age, you shouldn't have debt. Your home should be paid for. Your automobile, your transportation should be paid for. You should be moderate. I mean, <clears throat> these people were raised in the same era as I, and they don't understand yet. One thing I can tell you, you know, when you have the good life and you've got a, <laughs> a six-figure income all during your working life, but you do not put anything away for the future. You've not planned for the day of when all you're going to have is your little piddly social security and maybe a retirement fund if it doesn't go bankrupt first. If you haven't planned, it's like I've told people, if you have failed to plan, you have just planned to fail. And it's sad to see people in this kind of a situation. They don't know where to go. They don't know where to turn. They don't know where they can get help. Well, I'm prevented by the protocol of the Senior Companion Program from being a counselor. But boy, I'll tell you what, it's going to hurt. It's like Brother Al says, I've got the answer. You know, and the Bible says, says, I've got the answer. I know the answer. I do know the answer. The scriptures provide the answer. One of the first ones is, in order to avoid stress, is you don't live beyond your means. You don't live for tomorrow. You live for today. Sufficient for the day is the evil. So many experience stress when the money ends before the month does, and that because they threw sound judgment and common sense to the wind, forgetting that in these perilous times it's become necessary to balance income with the anticipated expense of living in a world that has and still is spinning out of control. 
And of course, stress is just never a personal problem, is it? Stress has a way of transcending what's personal into problems with interpersonal relationships that pit husbands and wives and parents with, and, and their children at variance with one another. It affects productivity in the workplace. In school, too, pupils will bring, home, bring from home stress into the classroom, pass it around to their peers and to the teacher, who in, in addition to having the challenge of pro providing and creating a learning environment is now having to become an enforcer of law and order. I've been there and done that too. From a physiological perspective, cardiocerebral vascular diseases and a variety of pathogenic disorders, including cancers, are products of stress. Stress underlies panic attacks and a whole range of mental health disorders, which the medical profession typically treats with the prescription of tranquilizers and psychotropic pharmaceuticals, and paraprofessionals address with mind over matter transcendental therapeutic meditation techniques, like yoga. Stress is a major contributor to what I call the seven Ds. You see, during tabernacles, it was four. But I keep adding to it because and seven is a complete number, isn't it? Yeah, it's complete, all right. Listen to the last one, but I'll give that to you at the last. Starts with disappointment, discouragement. This is progressive, by the way, and I want you to understand these, these, this is a progression. Disappointment, discouragement, depression, despondency, despair, Denial, and at the point of denial is when you become very angry. It's like the five increments to the grief process. Denial happens to be with them and happens to be one of them, and so does anger. Denial, and then lastly, death, and very often by suicidal death. People commonly deal with stress by turning to what's always sweet in the beginning, but bitter in its end. People are short-sighted. They can't see what the end of the matter is from the very beginning. You know, Yahweh's the opposite. He can see the end of the matter from the very beginning. And you know what? He is schooling us to be able to have the same capacity to see the ending of every matter from the beginning. We are to walk in what? Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. And when you throw those three to the wind, you're headed for great difficulty in this life. He wants us to be wise, right? He wants us to understand. And so he gives us the manual for life. And if we seek to master the content of this book, we will be wise. Yes. So they commonly deal with stress by turning to what's always sweet in the beginning, bitter in the end. And this is how we do it. We too by making provision for the flesh to fulfill its sundry affections and lusts. Turning to sin as a means by which to distract ourselves from facing the reality of our stress. I'm gonna give you one, two, three, four, five, seven. And there could be more, but these occurred to me. Lethargy. People who are suffering under acute depression have difficulty getting up in the morning. They can't sleep. They suffer from acute insomnia, and that oftentimes is a result of staying up late, surfing the internet, or watching television. Anything, or, or the, well, let me get into this a little bit. Lethargy, they can't and don't want to get out of bed in the morning because they've stayed up all night watching TV, surfing the internet, or have all the effects of alcohol withdrawal. And that's the second one, alcohol. Some think they can drown out their stress through the neck of a bottle. That's a common thing. You got problems, they'll go away. 
Just give me some Jack Daniels or a little bit of Jim Beam. They are antidotes for everything that you suffer, right? Wrong. Wrong. Eating disorders. I have to tell you, I was in a client's house this last week, and I said, I guess it was Thursday. I had the television on. I tried to stimulate them in a little bit, you know, they're cognitive, you know, but this man, he's 86 years old, and he's just sitting there. And something caught my eye peripherally. 1,000 pound sisters. I couldn't believe what I saw. This van opens up and out rolls, literally rolls, this 1,000 pound woman. Nasal can I don't know how she could even, well, she couldn't have, she had to have assistance. And, but they showed her sitting down. It, I'll tell you what, it, take my three of those chairs, nasal cannula, huffing and puffing, you know, it, 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 it was pathetic. Now, she may have had some kind of disorder, probably began with eating disorder. I, but, you know, a Hoyer lift in a hospital setting, with the, they, they are, they are, <laughs> They will haul a 700-pound person. I've used Hoyer lifts. Well, you couldn't even lift them up with a Hoyer lift. You'd have to get a little crane in there to do it. You know, to get them out of bed to the toilet. I mean, just and trying to put them on a bed. I don't know how you would do it. Wouldn't know where to begin. She was a young woman. I mean, but the, facially, I don't know how old she was. I, she looked like she might be in her 40s, perhaps. And how she lived that long, I don't have any idea. Yes, eating disorders, a disease, D-Y-S-E-A-S-E, -E, a disease that results and provide, produces lifelong repercussions, diabetes being among high blood pressure, you know, high cholesterol. I mean, you know, it just goes on and on and on and on. Gambling, on the river, at the casino, at the racetrack, virtual gambling websites, or through scratchers purchased at the sea store. And I'll tell you, that's the most annoying thing to me, to buy fuel, because in Missouri, you know, probably other states too, you got all these scratchers. And I'm gonna tell you something, that's something, I'm gonna just mention this to you. You don't need to be involved in that. There's a scripture in Proverbs that says, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. And I've seen that. You don't need to be involved. You are commanded to work with your two hands. Not to be gambling. That's right. That's the way it should be. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Yes. But anyway, you stand there, you wait, you wait. You know, you got places to go, people to see too, right? You got this person sitting there, and there's about three of them in front of you, and one cashier. You all, you're smiling. You know what I'm talking about. And this guy's up here, or this gal's up here, and they can't figure out which scratcher they want because they're all so pretty looking, you know, in the display case. They've just bought $5 a fuel, give the man a $20 bill, and they're going to spend $15 on gambling products. Then I've seen him go to the deli, sit at the table, do the little scratch deal, didn't win, come right back and stand at the end of the line to buy more tickets or scratchers. You think that's addiction? Yes, it's become an addiction that in turn has exhausted resources and made you to look to other illicit means to support your iniquity beg, borrow, or steal. Promiscuous sexual behavior. Surfing internet pornography sites. Making a trip to your town's red light district, if you happen to have one. Cultivating a surreptitious extramarital relationship at work. Recreational drugs. 
advantaging oneself of Missouri's legalization of marijuana on demand, which, of course, has become a gateway to the harder stuff. Chemical substance abuse, overuse of prescription analgesic and psychotropic drugs that swells your brain so you can't function in the exercise of activities of daily living. Stress is exacerbated through the loss of employment, financial woes attributable to debt, sickness for which there's no apparent, apparent cure or for which treatment is costly. Stress as the inherent capacity of destroying marriages, relationships with your children, facilitating the immutable scriptural outcome of your iniquity, transgression, and sin, becoming a visitor to your children and your children's children. Stress is only a symptom of the disease. And that's what needs to be cured is the disease. But what we do as, peop as a people, and I, I, I trust not anyone here, is we treat not the disease, but the symptom. And we do it through seeking out carnal pleasure, running to an excess of riot and revelry, then wonder why we've got the hangover in the morning. I'm not just talking about a hangover from alcohol, a hangover from anything. Go out to the mailbox and all you got is bills and they stack up on the table. Then you've got, <laughs> you've got collectors knocking at your door or just wearing out your phone. You know what I'm talking about? Then the next thing you got the sheriff's department at your door. Right. You find yourself in a court. You find yourself deceitfully by deceitfully justifying the irrationality of your stress, like the adulteress. Remember when we read this in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 20? The adulteress, she ate, she belched. I'm adding that. You know, she ate, she belched, she wiped her mouth, and then proclaimed, I've done no wickedness. And we've all been there too. Yahweh understands. I'm stressed out. It's a way of relieving my stress. But let's look at and understand stress from a scriptural perspective. And I got a whole list here, more than seven. Of stress, Solomon observed, heaviness in the heart of a man makes it to stoop. By sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. All the days of the afflicted are evil. Afflicted by what? Afflicted by stress are evil. Stress, like fear and worry, is good for little more than to produce torment. You know, we read that in 1 John, don't we? Yahweh is love. Yahweh is love. Perfect love does what? It casts out all fear, and fear has torment. Worry has torment, too. Stress has torment. What I'm proposing to you here is that worry and doubt and, 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 and stress are all related, one with another. Yes, stress like fear and worry is good for little more than to produce torment. The outcome of unrestrained imagination has gone awry. Stress Stress is further accentuated by one leaning to his own understanding. There's where it starts right there a lot of times. Leaning to your own understanding, failing to trust, acknowledge Yahweh in all his ways. Proverbs, five, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Stress omits Yahweh, who is sure and steadfast, who is an anchor to the soul, it omits Yahweh from the calculus of life and which is certain to make your way rough and uncertain. 
Didn't you ever read there in the Nabi, in the prophet Isaiah? He said, this is what he says. Actually, Yahweh is saying. He would make the rough places smooth so that your foot would be on an even place so that you would not stumble. He would exalt every valley and would lower every hill so that you would walk in an even place. But stress destroys all that. And the reason is because we, listen, there's, see, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Every commandment in this book is followed up with a promise. If you will trust and acknowledge him in all his ways, then will he direct your path. You omit him, you're on your own. And you know the path you will take? The wide path, the broad way, whose end is what? Destruction. Stress produce, precludes Yahweh from directing your path and deprives you of his exceedingly great and precious promise of supplying all your need according to his riches and glory by Messiah Yeshua. Stress is a first cousin to worry, also related by affinity to unbelief. Unbelief that Yahweh can perform through the administration of his word that good work that he had begun in you in renewing you in the spirit of your mind and conforming you into the image of his dear son. Stress gives place to the cares and affairs of this life. Now, let's turn to a couple of scriptures. Let's go back to Mark. I think it's Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. It's Yahshua's discussion on the four types of ground upon which the seed falls. Mark chapter 4. I want to look at verse 19. Well, let's just let's move up a little bit further. Verse 18. And these are they which are sown among thorns such as hear the word and the cares of this world. And then you go to Second um, uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And the Apostle Paul, he says there that no soldier going to war entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he might please him who has called him. No soldier, that's, that's us, who goes to a warfare will entangle himself with the affairs of this life. So we read here in verse 19, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things entering in. Listen, that is the formula for stress. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lusts of other things entering in. It is the formula for stress. It chokes the word. We know that Yahweh is the word, right? So that you become unfruitful. Well, that's what it says here. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. We're talking about the seed. It becomes unfruitful. And that's just exactly what stress produces, unfruitfulness, barrenness, right? People lose everything they got because of stress. And the, one of the principal things that they lose in this life is their family because of stress. I know stress might be attributable to oh, loss of employment. It can, be a, it can be attributable to a lot of things. But again, he's called us to peace. Stress gives place to the cares and affairs of this life, which ensnare men, pierce them through with many sorrows. This is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, before drowning them progressively in the seven Ds. Disappointment, discouragement, depression, despondency, despair, denial, and death. Stress is the antithesis of that perfect peace to which we've been called. Isaiah 26, 3, he that keeps his mind stayed on him, will have perfect peace. 
get your mind off of him, and I want to tell you, it will, you allow yourself to become distracted, and you're treading a dangerous course. That's why Paul would write there in 1 Corinthians 7, 35, he says, brethren, I would, right there in the middle of the marriage chapter, you know, I guess he just had an instant inspiration. Has nothing to do with marriage at all. But he says, brethren, I would not have you to be distracted that you may give attendance unto the master. It's good advice, all right? Very good advice. Not just in terms of marital relationships, but in all kinds of relationships. Yes, stress, stress is the antithesis of that perfect peace to which we've been called, that perfect peace that is the property of him whose mind is instead stayed upon Yahweh. Stress takes thought for the life that now is and robs one of both the hope and the joy of the life that could be. That better and enduring substance of the incorruptible, undefiled life that can be in the kingdom of heaven. But I want to tell you, you don't have to wait to the ethereal to get there. You know, time is in the continuum of eternity. You understand that, don't you? You got to stop and think about that for a minute. Time, we are just in the continuum of eternity. Our time on this earth. It's just a portion, put it that way. It's just a part of eternity. Time doesn't exist for that matter. Exactly. But we rob ourselves of our future by dwelling in the present or even in the past. Hey, we are to become and have become new creations in Mashiach, right? Former things are supposed to be passed away. Stress denies, I already mentioned this to you, stress denies Yahweh his supernal deliverance from the torment of worry. Stress gives license to the tongue. That's usually where it's first expressed. Is the tongue. That unruly evil. That one capacitor, four inches long, capable of slaying six-foot men, six-feet men, the tongue. Yeah. Sometimes we don't understand, well, I think a bit off more than I can chew. That's, 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 you know, I want to tell you, we go against Goliaths every day, right? Gives license to the tongue, that unruly evil, right out of James chapter 3, full of deadly poison, set on fire of Gehenna, setting on fire all the course of nature. You know, we've witnessed it. We've experienced it ourselves. Little family disputes between a husband and a wife. Children, they witness it. And they mimic it. And then we think we can discipline our children for not getting along with one another because of something they witnessed in us? Hey, wait a minute. We're the ones that need to be spanked. Yeah. To speak unadvisedly such things that quite come short and fail the test of what's good, acceptable, and useful to edifying. Bottom line, stress gives place to the devil. And you know, as sometimes I get block up here, you know, I didn't see this until I prepared this message, really. But in that cognomen, devil, is the word evil. Now, maybe you all saw that before me, but I just recognize that. Yeah. And the word devil is evil. <laughs> I guess we could call it devil, couldn't we? Yeah. Evil. May I echo the injunction of the Apostle Shaul who advised neither give place to the devil. Why? Because if you give him one inch, he'll become a ruler. Now you've heard that before, right? Give the devil an inch and he'll become a ruler. Almost done, Brother John. For in giving admittance to the devil, to the devil, I think I'm going to start saying it that way from now on, devil. And to those that are coming in, I have to say, now I'm going to give you a new word to add to your vocabulary. And this is the way it's spelled. D-E-V-I-L, but it's pronounced devil. I like that. 
For giving admittance to the devil, you tender an advantage to him to subtly and cunningly occasion the opportunity to distract and draw you away from committing an unknown future to one who knows the ending of every matter from the very beginning and whose thoughts toward us are thoughts of peace and not of evil to bring us to an expected end in glory in him. Isaiah 29. His thoughts toward us are thoughts of peace to bring us to an expected end. And so now we come to the conflict that rages within every one of us. Stress is the parent of doubt and unbelief. And that gives credence to the axiom, if we believe, we receive. If we doubt, we do without. If we believe, we receive. If we doubt, we do without. That's why James there in the first chapter says, listen, ask Yahweh what you will, but ask in faith for a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You know, he's a double-minded man. is like a wave of the sea that wavers back and forth, back and forth. But Yahweh didn't call us to be a vacillating people. You know what vacillate means? Oh, I'm here. This, I'm, you know, he didn't cause us to. He's not wanting a people like this. He's wanting a people that are established, strengthened, and settled, and able to put their hands on the sacred desk and say, yay and amen. So let me conclude by giving you the advice of Scripture. I'll give you the scripture references. And I've only got five here. Actually, it's a combination. It's a collage of scriptures I put together. But five is the number of grace. Isn't that wonderful? Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 19. Philippians 4, 6 and 19. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Well, let me pause there for a moment. That's part of praying amiss, isn't it? This is just not occurring to me. You know, James says, well, let me just read what James says in James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Verse 2, you envy or lust and have not, you kill, you desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you ask not. Verse 3, you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. Now this is just occurring to me. Do you believe that Yahweh is able to speak to you in a moment? Listen to what it says here in Philippians 4. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. May I submit to you that when we pray and supplicate with, before him, we treat Yahweh as like he's an ATM machine. Stick in your prayer request and now pops the prize. And that's what I'm saying, Elder, uh, Elder Tom, that with, when we omit thanksgiving, we are praying amiss. And that's just occurring to me now, and I'm thankful for that. It's with your prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. And if you're not thankful, thankful for what? Well, first of all, be thankful for all the benefits that he has loaded you on you this day. Psalm 66, verse 18. Be thankful for the benefits that he has loaded upon you this day. And by faith be thankful for that which you expect and require of him. Oh, yes, it's his desire to give you the petitions of your heart that are according to his will. So when you pray, make supplication, you do it with thanksgiving. And to omit the thanksgiving part is to be praying amiss. I'm just getting that now. Yeah. Yes, be Anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to Yahweh, who shall supply all your need, not your greed. Then say he'll supply all your greed. Supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Mashiach Yeshua. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. And Mark 4, 19. We've already looked at Mark 4, 19. No man is a good soldier of Yahshua HaMashiach entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Did you catch that? Yahweh wants a people that is single-minded, not a people that are double-minded. You can't hold hands with Yahweh and run with the, with the devil. <laughs> I like that. You can't hold hands with Yahweh and run with the devil. See, that, that's an attention getter, brother. You know, someone new comes in there and you start talking about the evil one and call him devil. I say, what in the world? Is he speaking some kind of t different tongue or something? No. <laughs> Satan claws. Yeah. Satan claws. Interesting. It has exactly the same, same, same letters. Just rearranged a little bit. <laughs> Took me a while to figure that one out, too. Like, oh, I'll be. I never saw that before. <laughs> I'll tell you what. You stick with Yahweh, and there's a lot of things that you'll ne you have never seen before. That's just the way he is. Oh, hallelujah. I love him. No man as a good soldier of Yeshua HaMashiach entangles himself with the affairs of this life, with the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25, 31 through 34. Matthew chapter 6, 25, verses 31 through 34. And Luke 12, 29. What I've done here is I've just made a collage of words, but it's all good. It's all the word. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things, but seek first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. And then Luke 12, 29, neither be of doubtful mind. And actually, the Luke 12 scripture is a parallel to what we read in Matthew chapter 6. That's one thing I like to do when I'm reading the scriptures, particularly the words of Mashiach. Because what you don't get in Matthew, you'll get in Luke. What you don't get in Mark, you'll get in John. You don't understand what I'm saying? And I like to kind of look at all the parallels just to, just to get the little nuances, the little things that are a little bit different, you know, and put them all together. And that way you get the full message, or as much of the message as is presented to you in the text. And then Ruach will give you more if it's required. Don't you love his administration, Elder David? His way is perfect, converting the soul. James 1, 6 through 8. James 1, 6 through 8. Ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think he will receive anything of the sovereign one, for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And then the last one is a clause from three different books. John 14, 1. John 14, 1. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 and 29. And 1 Peter 5, 7. 1 Peter 5, 7, and I've arranged them in this, this order. Let not your heart be troubled. This begins three chapters in Yochanan's, three chapters of Yochanan in which Yeshua bids and provides his, gives his farewell message to his Talmudim. And he, he starts out, John 14, 15, and 16. He's speaking to the disciples. John 17, they've retired to Gethsemane by that point. But John 14 through 16, he's speaking to his Talmudim. And it is beautiful how he introduces this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, believe also in him. He wasn't going to leave them comfortless. He told them that where I'm going, I'm going to prepare. I mean, that's the introduction. You know, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. But just those words, let not your heart be troubled. 
And I want to tell you something. I, I hope and, 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 and I'm praying even now, trusting, when I begin to feeling the pinch, the stress, that those words, Ruach, I'd ask you, oh, Yahweh, and just, just bow with me in prayer. Father, in the holy name of Yeshua HaMashiach, whensoever this life throws us a curveball, or we feel pinched in our spirit, and the evil one, the devil, would seek to bring to us feelings of distress, please bring these words to our minds. The very words that the Mashiach spoke unto his Talmudim to introduce his farewell address, let not your heart be troubled. We ask it of you in the name of Yeshua. All you that labor and are heavy laden, come to him. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Let us stand. Father, there was a thought that was quickened to me during the Bible study this morning and, or this afternoon earlier, and I didn't speak it, but I'll speak it now. As we were talking about all the lies that are in the world and how we've been lied to, most of us, for the most of our lives, and how we've had to unlearn and ditch so many things because they were void of truth. And we know, my Father in heaven, that our salvation is predicated upon truth, receiving truth. And the thought that came to my mind through our discussion this morning or this afternoon earlier was the whole world. This is an observation that the Apostle Yochanan made in 1 John chapter 5, I think it's verse 19 or 21. The whole world lies in wickedness. The whole world lies in deception. And then I'm reminded just now, my father, how the Apostle Shaul wrote there in 2 Corinthians 4, 2. How that we are to renounce the hidden thing of dishonesty. And may I add, darkness and deception. Commanded to renounce the hidden thing. Well, if it's hidden, that means it's got to be uncovered. And thy word, O Yahweh, is a lamp and a light to our discovering that which is secreted in the recesses of our hearts, the thing that has been hidden, the thing that we've received, O Father, even as that which was veritable. But now we are discovering that the devil has been he. Yes, a liar, the father of lies, a murderer from the very beginning, to plant seeds. deception and dishonesty in our hearts. We renounce these now in the holy name of Yeshua the Messiah and fill thy, that void, I pray, my Father, with thy truth that we from henceforth may have before you and before all men a conscience that is clean and void of offense. I thank you for these people, Father, who have given audience both here and on the internet. And pray, my Father in heaven, that we may all be quickened by your spirit this day. In Yeshua's precious name, hallelujah. thing about stress and you brought this up in your in the message is it will it, you cling to the past you're holding on to the past if you hold on to the past you don't have there's no future if you live in the past you can't experience your future also it makes you look back at the past and if we turn if we look back we are not worthy for the kingdom of heaven that's what it says and exactly. yeah she was saying your hands to the cloud and bring them back yep so we just need to put it all on Yahweh. He'll take it from us. That's what Yahshua said. 
All right, let's sing for some praises to Heavenly Father. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Isn't that nice? Peace. <laughs> we need peace. Amen. Pray for the peace. <laughs>
close in scripture. This one's on two slides. It's Isaiah chapter 33, verse uh, 2 through 6, all in unison. O Yahweh, be gracious to us. We have waited for you. Be their arm every morning. Our salvation also in the time of trouble. At the noise of the tumult, the people shall flee. When you lift yourself up, the nation shall be scattered, and your plunder shall be gathered. Like the gathering of the caterpillar, as the running to and fro of locusts, he shall run upon them. Yahweh is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with justice and righteousness. Wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times, and the strength of salvation, the fear of Yahweh, is his treasure. Hallelujah. I'd like to invite Elder David to come up and close us out with prayer. Imagine that. The fear of Yahweh is a treasure. Yeah, that's awesome. beginning of wisdom. Yeah, the beginning of wisdom. It's interesting. Stress, you know, a little stress is actually good for us. And we're not going to get out of this life without stress. But we can rely on Yahweh, as brought out in the message. And uh, ultimately, uh, we don't have to worry because uh, Yahweh is not going to give us more than we can handle. It can sometimes feel that way, though. I mean, I know it does. So let's go before Yahweh's throne and put it in his hands, his capable hands. Almighty Father Yahweh, we are very grateful to be able to come before you this Sabbath day, the day that you've set apart from creation. Father, we do appreciate all that you are and all that you've done and are doing and have yet to do. In this short life that we're given, uh, we do have stress, we have stressors, but Father, we can rely on you and we can rely on the Master who has promised to give us peace that passes all understanding. And Father, as we do keep our eyes focused on you through him, uh, we know that uh, you know, we will be able to go through any difficulties that come our way and be able to successfully uh, conquer and overcome. And Father, we thank you, Father, for not giving us more than we can handle, but um, with, with any temptation, a way out so that we may be able to bear it. And Father, we, we are just grateful for your love, your kindness, your mercies, and Father, even for your discipline. We thank you, and we thank you for your sternness at times because it helps us to keep on the straight and narrow. Help us to do those things which are pleasing to you, Father. Help us to be fearful, honoring you, respecting your word, and following in it. As we do, we're following in the Master's footsteps. We thank you for all this through him. In Yahshua's name, hallelujah. Amen. Well, till next week, don't forget to cast all your cares upon him who cares for you. You are blessed. Shalom. <laughs>